following people on social media and people are looking to see how many followers they can get and we can have the life sucked out of us by negativity, politics, and opinions that are prevalent, it may be time to really look at who we should be following. The conversation for today as we begin with a call to worship. Lent calls us to journey, this and every day, following Jesus wherever he leads. Lent calls us to journey to the place where God covenants with us, to receive the new names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together, to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to practice justice, to bring God's hope to all people. Lent calls us into faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Lent calls each of us to take up our cross, to trust the one who bears it with us. Lent calls us to journey with God. Let us worship God who walks with us this and every day. It's a wonderful old hymn that really speaks to this week's scripture reading. Take up your cross. there's always a place for prayer. And so we come together in a moment of prayer. Loving and holy God, our creator, Christ and guide, you speak the words of life to us. In you, we find our heart's desire. By your grace, we are saved. With the, when the way forward is unclear, you shed light. When we are troubled, you give peace. When times are difficult, you stir courage and hope. Our deepest longing is to know you and to be known by you. In these difficult days, we praise you for your faithfulness to us. Draw near to us in our time of worship, O God, and open the way before us so that we may follow Jesus without wavering, trusting him to lead us. Although following you brings joy, O God, we confess the way is sometimes hard for us. There are times we get tired and would eagerly settle for an easier road. Some days we find the task of loving others hard. Sometimes we choose anger over forgiveness or ignore the needs of our neighbors. 
Forgive us when our commitment to you wavers. Forgive us when we take that easier path. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit to move in us and among us so that we may hear your voice speaking in the scriptures. Open our minds and hearts to encounter your living word and give us the courage to follow no matter what the cost. Stir the embers of our devotion and kindle a brighter flame. Strengthen our determination to follow where you lead and renew our energy to serve in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the good news. God does not go back on promises made so long ago. God does not reject us. God redeems us. God does not withhold love. God pours it into our barren lives. Forgiven of our sins, filled with hope, living in relationship with God and one another, we are a new people. Thanks be to God. As we are in the second Sunday of Lent, we hear a scripture from the Gospel of Mark. The reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He turned and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, for them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A favorite childhood game is Follow the Leader. You may know the game, but for anyone who may not have played, basically one person gets to lead and everybody else follows what you are doing, literally following behind the one that is doing the leading. I remember times when I couldn't see what was coming up in front of me and getting caught off guard by an obstacle in my path, whether it was a thing or a person. One hope for a good leader who could make things interesting but not so challenging or dangerous that it took the fun out of the game. Many wanted to be the leader because then you could decide how silly or challenging the game would be. Leaders had control. There is a moment in the scripture reading today in which Jesus says to Peter, get behind me Satan for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. Now I'm going to pull that all together in a moment, but I want you to know a little background, which may be helpful here. Jesus, or just a short time before what you heard read in the scripture um, from the Gospel of Mark today, Jesus asked a dis his disciples a few questions, such as, who do people say I am? To which they responded, John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. Then he asked, who do you say I am? It was Peter who, like the eager kid in class with a hand up, waving in the air, barely able to contain his or herself because they are so excited that they have the answer, responds, Peter responds by saying, you are the Messiah. Peter got the right answer. 
He knew that Jesus was the one that had been spoken about in the Hebrew scriptures. Peter understood that Jesus was the one who was going to right the wrongs, bring about a new order, make things great again. But rather than be able to shout it from the rooftops, Jesus sternly ordered them, the disciples, not to tell anyone about him. Though the time was right for Peter, and he was ready to storm the capital, Jesus was saying no, not the time or the place. You see, Jesus understood that Peter, the other disciples, even the crowds that were seeking him out, wanted to overthrow the powers of the day. They wanted to have power for themselves, and Jesus had to be their answer. They could not yet understand that Jesus, what Jesus was saying to them, what Jesus was teaching them. Our reading today started with the words, then he began to teach them. Them being the disciples and the crowds, and really us now. Jesus had to teach them what it really meant that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of Man. They had recognized his power. They saw it in the way the crowds were drawn to him and in the healing miracles. But when Jesus spoke, saying the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again, well, Peter couldn't resist the urge to correct Jesus and his understanding of how things should go down. Peter takes Jesus aside. I see it like a movie scene where the good friend takes the central character off to the side and basically says, nah, you got it all wrong. You can't suffer, be rejected and die. That's not how you take over a government. Writer Paul, writer Paul Shoup says it this way, Peter was blinded by his own preconception. He cherished his convictions about what the Messiah's agenda should be, or his convictions about what the Messiah's agenda should be, would not allow him to see what the Messiah's agenda must be. Jesus doesn't hold in his frustration. This is, where, this is where he gives it back to Peter full throttle, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus then follows up by getting the attention of not just the disciples, but the whole crowd and says to them, If you want to become my follower, let if any want to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. There are meanings in those statements about get behind and being a follower. In most basic terms, if you are going to oppose Jesus' agenda, well, you might as well get behind Jesus because he's not going to put up with the BS. Get behind and be gone. If you plan on following Jesus, that also means getting behind Jesus. But in this scenario, you stay close. It is more like a, an imitation game, a game of follow the leader. The thing is, you are not imitating or following to be a type of patsy or puppet. But rather, you follow to learn, to be taught, to be given a depth of understanding about human suffering, struggle, and challenge. Following Jesus in this manner means going where Jesus goes. And to be clear, Jesus is not headed for the glam of the palaces. Jesus is headed for a cross. If any want to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Throughout history, people and churches have spoken about taking up one's cross as a justification of suffering. Speaking of bearing one's cross is often used when times are difficult and hardship seems to be a constant friend. It can feel like a cross to bear. But might it be that to take up one's cross means to do what Jesus is doing? Jesus was speaking to power, politics, and prestige, and saying this was not God's will. 
What people were experiencing was not God's will. The suffering of the most vulnerable, this was not God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, all would have what they need to thrive emotionally, physically, mentally, and socially. Jesus was heading straight into the thick of things and was going to be killed for it. Jesus was a threat to those who liked the status quo that kept people in their place. Jesus was an advocate for the poor, the sick, and those in prison. He was not afraid to call out empire. And yes, if you want to think Star Wars, go ahead. There are threads there to grasp onto. Though Jesus is headed into his death and knows it, this passage is really about saving lives. He says, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Ira Drigger writes, when this passage is taken out of context, it seems to, it seems to suggest that the mission ha, that the mission of Jesus and his disciples is to suffer and die. However, when we read it within its narrative context, we come to see that the mission of Jesus and his disciples is to give life, knowing that earthly powers will violently oppose them. Jesus was all about living life abundantly. This does not mean, nor did it ever mean, having an abundant bank account, an abundance of food, or a lot of friends, or whatever abundance is to you that is ties to human greed and ego. Having abundant life is about peace, hope, joy, grace, forgiveness, and love. It is about ending suffering. It is about hope for those who have none, love for those who feel lost and forgotten. It is about food for the hungry, justice for those who have no voice, and grace enough to see the humanity in everybody. Jesus is going to die, but after three days will rise again. This is about resurrected life for all. Not that we will come back to life after being physically dead, but that we will have life while we are living. Jesus is no longer physically present with us, but we are still called to be followers. Those who go where Jesus goes, to follow Jesus into places where power forgets that there are those who are in need, who need to be lifted up. In a world where instant gratification is the expectation, Jesus calls us to be it in, for, be in it for the long game. Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It will make you question and wonder, cry and at times suffer. But it is the most amazing game of follow the leader you will ever play, where everyone who plays wins, everyone who follows will have life and life abundant in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. As we ponder the message and think about the hymn and the earlier prayer, our call to worship, we come now once again to a time of prayer. It's called Prayers of the People. It's for people, for creation, for ourselves. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the vision you have for our lives, the promises you have made to us and the journey you opened before us. Today we remember with gratitude the way our ways our lives are held secure in uncertain times by our trust in you. Moments in these months of pandemic that made us laugh or smile. Moments when we felt your gifts of courage and patience times when you helped us overcome temptation, the people who love us and give us encouragement. Gracious God, we are grateful for all these signs of your love in our lives. Thank you for the hope they bring us. Show us how to share this hope and love with others who are struggling in these difficult days. 
Faithful God, we pray for healing and restoration in the world that is our home. Hear us as we name and silence the needs and concerns we carry today. We pray for people, places, and situations deeply in need of your grace, especially as they face the fears and frustrations of co coping with COVID-19. We pray for those who struggle to feed, clothe, or house themselves and their families, and all those who worry about their economic future. We pray for those who are weak or vulnerable for any reason, and for all who lack dignity and respect in our community. We pray for the earth and its well-being, that areas and species under threat will be cared for. We pray for peace with justice in regions of the world facing turmoil. And we pray for all those offering leadership and service in these times of hope and anxiety, for those planning how to offer vaccines in our communities, and for those uncertain about vaccination. By the power of your spirit, O oh God, work in us and through us. May we bring the light and love of your kingdom into our relationships and our community in all we do and say. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray in these words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Jesus challenged his followers to deny themselves in order to follow him. Our offerings express to God our willingness to give not just a little something, but to commit resources we could have used in other ways for God's purposes instead. We are blessed to be able to give. If you would like to learn more about St. Andrews, get involved in our ministry and work or make a donation toward the life and ministry of St. Andrews Presbyterian Church in Thunder Bay, uh, please visit our website at standrewspres-tbay.ca. There you can find more information and connect with me if you choose. The great question that Jesus asks, one of them, is will you come and follow me? And so the hymn that we're about to hear asks that question.
discipleship requires commitment and faith. Go now in peace, bringing the good news of Jesus' love to all people. Do not be afraid. God is with you.